G'day humans, welcome to the safe space for dangerous ideas and today a true living legend. For more than a half a century, Peter Garrett has occupied the consciousness of Australians and many people around the world. You may know him from this little number. That's right, he's the lead singer of Midnight Oil, one of the most iconic bands in Australian history. But he's not just that. He is also an environmentalist and a politician and an activist. Uh, at the same time as he was a superstar in Australia for his music career, he became the head of the Australian Conservation Foundation, one of the country's uh, biggest environmental groups, and then went into politics with all of the compromises and difficulties that that might entail. He became the Minister for the Environment. He went on to be Minister for Education in the Australian government. He um, spearheaded the campaign against Japanese whaling in uh, the Southern Ocean, which ended that particular practice. Uh, an incredible person with a lot of incredible thoughts about all of the biggest issues that face us from climate chaos to the way that we live our lives, energy independence and the rise of China. Uh, his new solo album is called The True North. It's with his band The Alter Egos. It drops on March 15th. He'll be touring Australia in March. Please enjoy the one and only, the living legend, Peter Garrett. The part of the actually, when I was in high school, I, came, I went on holiday to New York, and my icon, my idol at the time was David Letterman. Ah, uh -huh. and oh, I got yeah. tickets six months in advance no. to go to get. I, I was ticket number one for that night. This was at the peak of Letterman's like prowess, mid to late nineties, and the and you were the act. Yeah, we did that night. quite a few times. It just would have been yeah. probably maybe like 96 or something. Yeah, no. yeah, that'd be right. Do you remember the first time going on Letterman? Totally. You know, I remember. Why? Because we said to somebody, oh, we're going on Letterman. Like we met some other band somewhere and they said, oh, make sure you take your thermals. Yeah. <laughs> we went, what? <laughs> Explain that for people who don't know. Uh, so we used to have the air conditioning on. So yes. like, it was so cold, so no one would fall asleep. Yeah. Because you didn't want people to fall asleep. He had asleep. a theory about comedy that it was, you know, that you're, you're more, if you're freezing cold, yeah. you're kind of more likely to pay attention, you're more likely to laugh, you're more jittery, all, you're more. All, all of the above. Yeah. But I, but I also think it was the fact that, like, it's Manhattan. And New Yorkers have had a big day. You know, they've battled in and out of Manhattan. They've, they've worked. They've queued up. Then they're sitting there. That's a very literal to... interpretation, perhaps. I mean, these are all tourists, though. They're all people. All people who well, come in from they're, Idaho. They're well, on the, you know, they're, a New Yorker. There is were not a few potato like farmers there. Yeah. But, yeah. Do you remember? And was that a weird, surreal experience for you going on the huge American shows, or did you not really understand that whole why that whole thing was big? Oh no, no, no. We understood. I mean, we'd been touring. We toured the states early. Um, but we weren't a mainstream band, but of course, so at night, you know, if we had a night off, you you watch telly, yeah, and so we would watch Carson and Letterman and Jay Leno and whoever, yeah, and you realise it's a part of it's a part of the zeitgeist, mm, absolutely, and it's the water cooler discussions in the morning as you know, mm. who was on the night before and so on. So, I think the record company was amazed that they could actually get us on, you know, yeah, more than. We Why could there. you get on at that stage? I mean, I guess, you, well, by the mid-90s, you were a big act in Yeah, no, no. We, we we could get on because, A, we were a big act. We played a lot um, in a way that I think for us was quite natural. It was like we we replaced the pub circuit here with the college, theatre, Netherlander circuit there. Yeah. We didn't really think twice about it. We just thought, oh, that's what you do. You play every night. And I was going, like, you're driving from, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Nebraska to New Orleans yeah. to play the next night. We're like, it's a little yeah. bit long, but we're in a bus. It's okay. It's sort of like being a stand-up comic or something, isn't it? You hit totally. The road, yeah. yeah and but we're, we're used to doing it, and we're used to driving ourselves and doing it all that way. So, I mean, for me, there's a maybe it's just because I was a fan of the late night genre. But there was a, there's a big leap in status between being a touring band, correct, and being on Letterman. Yeah. And I wonder if there was ever a moment where you were sitting in the green room for the first time or something that you can recall going, "Fuck, we've, we, I think we've made it." Um, not so much like that, Josh. I think it was more, wow, Saturday night, like Friday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Letterman's so ubiquitous 
And who did he have on the night that we played? You know, Bill Clinton. Yeah, or, it would have been exactly. I don't know, even remember. All I remember. No, neither is do you. I. You know, yeah. Al Pacino <laughs> or you know Lady Gaga. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, yeah. And you're all sitting around with them. No, it, it was a strange thing. Um, our late departed dear uh, Kiwi bass player Bernsey Hillman was actually a really very naturally very funny man. And um, Letterman came and stuck his head in the first night that we were there and made some wisecrack. And Bones just started wisecracking with him. And I can see Lemon going, oh, what did you say? And, and he, he became affectionate towards us. He called us the Bushman. You know? Yes. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. There are wild Bushmen. Yeah, the wild know, Bushmen. Hold on your hats. Uh, sit down. There are, there are a bunch of Australian Bushmen. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. With, yeah, with uh, a kangaroo in our back pocket and yeah, you know, a, big, yeah. a big Paul Hogan knife. You know? That's right. Exactly. Um, so uh, congratulations on the new album. The, 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 kind, the point of um, like – the main uh, single that you've released is that it's never too late to save the world. Um, totally. Is that, a, is that a sentiment that comes naturally to you or is that something that you have to think yourself into in spite of yourself? No, I think it's part of my, my genuine DNA. You know, I, I, I quite often believe and have found that, you know, the 11th hour is quite often the most important minute. You know, your back's to the wall. But Are we at the 11th hour forward. at the moment? Uh, on some things, we're probably getting close. Yeah, what are those? Climate uh, and probably international peace and 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 love with nukes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a bumper sticker for you: mm. peace and love with nukes. Uh, I feel like we've been at the eleventh hour on climate for quite a while and you hear climate skeptics say look for 20 years we've been told that you know we've only got 12 minutes left and uh, you know the clock's approaching midnight yeah. but uh, where is this catastrophe that keeps being prognosticated um, yeah. how do you think of the timeline well I, of course the thing you say back to a skeptic is have you watched the news lately you know it's pretty evident well the timeline so i'm not a catastrophist uh, but I'm very familiar with the science and it's been a big part of my working life, particularly when I was in politics, but even other parts of my life. And the idea that we could stabilise climate um, will be an idea that will grow stronger over time, not weaker, as more and more people realise what's at stake and as we suffer more you know, climate events. So the question is, what kind of world does it become the more you delay action? Mm. And eventually you end up with a world that's pretty awful and very difficult. Are we and guaranteed to have that world, though, mm -hmm. given the lag between the, the emissions that we're letting out now and the impact that they have? Isn't there like a 20-year lag? Aren't we like sort of experiencing the effects now of the emissions that were being released 10, 15, 20 years ago and we've already baked in increasing catastrophe? Uh, well, we're, ba we're, ba we're, ba we're baked in around 1.5 degrees increase in global average temperatures. If that's we true. completely cut everything right now. Correct. We have to, that's that's why they set in the international negotiations this 1.5 degree thing, which people might have heard of. It's like scientists say we need to hold it about 1.5. We're pretty close to it because of what we've done already. You're absolutely right. Now, how do we sort of keep it there? Well, there's a couple of things we have to do. One thing is got to stop you know, burning fossil fuels straight away, um, you know, transform the energy system into renewables and make sure that you don't add any short-term sort of kicks into the system. And the obvious one is methane, which is a short-term gas, comes when you actually exploit natural gas, uh, when cows so fart. Some cows, yeah, <laughs> et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's very hot. Someone it's, said it's burping, actually. Someone said the fart thing it's, is, it's, a, is, well, it's, is a Well, it's both myth. ends. It's yeah, both right, ends. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah bur burping more. Yeah. So, uh, and then you've got to look at ways of actually pulling some of the already stored um, CO2 in the atmosphere out and storing it. And that's quite a vexed question. But mm. Those three things need to happen pretty urgently. You back that latter one? Uh, I'm sceptical about it. I think it can be used as a mechanism for delay. Yeah, uh, I mean, so I've, I've spoken to some environmentalists who are sceptical about the whole field of what might be called geoengineering, yeah. where, you, you know, you're trying to use science and technology to mitigate the effects of, of emissions, like by either drawing it out of the atmosphere. Some people talk about seeding the atmosphere with, you know, yeah, that's water nonsense. vapor or something yeah, no, to reflect um, sunlight back, or you yeah. put giant mirrors into orbit and Correct. reflect sunlight, all that kind of stuff. A parasol I mean, over the Great Barrier Reef. It's, isn't that conceivable? that you get to a point at which that's the least bad option? Uh, most of these options that you've mentioned are just totally fanciful and they're just basically, you know. What if they weren't? Because some scientists say they're not. Uh, well, 
like you know, a volcano erupts and you do see a decline in global temperatures for a couple of years when there's a huge volcanic eruption because of all the the sulfur in the atmosphere reflects a little bit of sunlight back into space. So I, mean, I think could, so, could work, so I right? think the short answer without boring your listeners to death yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is you've got to do a proper cost benefit analysis of what is being proposed and judge its effectiveness against other measures. Uh, so you know the the idea that you could sort of try something which would alter the natural rhythms, say, for example, climate patterns and weather and so on and so forth, by just randomly trying something, a little bit like introducing rabbits to Australia, but on a global scale with much potentially far-reaching and unknown consequences. If you're looking at something which has got material scientific validity, but they just haven't figured out a way of doing it yet, say, for example, like burying CO2, well, then there may be some prospects for it. But by far the easiest thing to do is use available good Solar, wind, energy efficiency, you know, mm. do the stuff that's there. We can, do, we can do it already. We don't have to think but about these things. what if we do all things. of that and still, you know, I mean, I can, I, I can imagine a scenario in which we do all that and still a big country like China experiences enough droughts and extreme weather uh, events that it goes, stuff this, we're just going to try. So, you know. Look, they may, they may, but but I think it's pretty clear from all the work that's been done internationally and all all that the scientists tell us and countries that are serious about it, particularly the European countries, is that there is a pathway to stabilising climate, but it does require. It's not about technical; it's about political. It's about having the will, the will to act. When you say it's not about technical, what about the advances that have been made technologically? I mean. You can we can have a whole argument about fracking and the upsides and downsides of that, yeah. but uh, I mean America is reducing is reducing its carbon emissions thanks to pivoting to natural gas from oil. Um, you know you've got things like Tesla and the electric car boom, and a lot of people do feel like technology will ultimately get us out of this without the heavy hand of government. Are they naive? Utterly, and and in fact. I mean, fracking's not getting us out of anything. It's just getting us into more trouble because you get a lot of methane with fracking. You get a lot of leakage uh, and the potential impact on groundwater, you know, aquifers below ground, uh, water systems and supplies and so forth is massive. And fracking has completely trashed and destroyed parts of the US already. It's a shocking industry, actually, and I, I, I really hope that we don't do too much of it here. The sort of arguments and the discussions that we're having, Josh, about it are, are fascinating in a way because what it really says underneath is that there's enough wordage and thinking around the place that essentially refuses to accept that we can't continue as business as usual and expecting a technological fix per se to get us out of, the, out of, out of trouble, but that we actually have to do a bigger change. And the part of the bigger change, which is pretty straightforward, is not that big. It's just saying to coal companies uh, and, and oil companies, your business model is damaging the planet and you now can no longer do it. And guess what? We've got other ways of making cars drive along a road and we've got other ways of uh, providing the power for us when we turn on our lights. Let's start using it. Right, but the biggest sort of advance in encouraging people to understand that we've got other ways of, uh, of driving cars along the road was a private individual who had a vision of making electric cars cool instead of dorky and went ahead and did it even in the absence of government action. Well, he's a dangerous individual who's managed to do one good bit of technology. And by the way, <laughs> do not forget that the Obama administration provided Tesla with a great deal of government support in its early sure. phase. I mean, a great deal of support for all car manufacturers, Absolutely. including petrol car yeah, yeah. manufacturers. Nothing, like happens, without, and, nothing with, happens without the hand of government sure, doing something, sure. hopefully the right way. Yeah, but they weren't putting their fingers on the scales of electric cars versus no, they petrol cars. No, they that, were still no, subsidising the no, that, industry. That, yeah, well, that, they, they were enthralled to uh, the, yeah. the, 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 the standard motor industry yep. thing on it. But no, you need to have a mix of both things. You need to harness and utilise the best of innovation and the best what the best and the brightest can do. And you need to provide a really solid, robust and, 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 and pretty stable environment in terms of laws and regulations to make it happen. And if you look at countries, I mean, look at South Australia. I mean, it's a great example. You know, there are many days in South Australia now where they actually run the whole of the state on solar panels. Mm. Now that happened because the South Australian government enacted a, enacted a certain number of le legislations and regulations to make that happen. And voila, it happens. Now, they're not building the solar panels. It's not the government that's installing them on people's roofs. It's not the government's coming up with the new solar panels, but they're just saying, hey, solar panels can work. Here's a way that they can. And of mm. course, once a government does that, 
it can happen easily. Speaking of Elon Musk, did I detect a jab at him? There's a lyric. <laughs> you did. There's a lyric did. where about taking selfies from outer space mm. in the song, and mm. I, I thought about Elon and Bezos and Branson yeah. and, all those uh, and the techno utopian infatuation yeah. with colonizing space. Correct. What do you make of that phenomenon at the moment? What's you know going what? on there? You know what? I, well. <clears throat> There's two things for me that, 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 that really make me sort of reach for the vomit bucket. Um, one is this idea that sort of these, these sort of mini egos, which are really in, people not that have so done many. very well in business. Not yeah, so that are not so many. They've done well in business. Figure that one way of manifesting this idea that I am a unique, great person, I'm intrepid, I'm adventurous, I'm whatever, is to spend oodles and oodles and produce lots of pollution to go do something as utterly futile and meaningless as to try and colonise a planet elsewhere, whilst at the same time, obvious comment, of course, but there's plenty of good things that they could be doing with their money here. The second thing, though, which for me is even more important, is that most of these techno-utopians and the libertarian strain amongst many of the people from Silicon Valley and um, Musk and others is actually fundamentally anti-democratic. They don't believe that governments can do anything particularly well. They'd like government to get the hell out of their lives. They're not committed to the idea of a common good and there's no social contract with them and, and the rest of the world, whether it's their workers, their customers maybe, but certainly not the rest of the world in terms of how they, they see things. They're quite attracted to what I think are extreme and dangerous philosophies and inimical in a way to the development that we've had over the last couple of hundred years, which for better or for worse has gotten to us to a point where we actually think we need to treat one another equally, irrespective of our genders, our race, our biases. And we need to provide for people uh, who aren't able to do as well as they could otherwise. So these guys are a danger and you know you might watch them support Trump, for example. I mean, Peter Thiel, uh, who's one of those people, as you would know, uh, I think it's throwing a bit of money. He's one of the founders of PayPal. Yeah, He's a big, all of that. Uh, huge libertarian yep. uh, force in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's a really interesting question here. And the question is, are we going to take what I would loosely describe as the European model or the American model as they've evolved? The European model recognises that in order to survive and to flourish, we have to cooperate. The American model says, believes that in order to survive and flourish, we need to give full reign to individual liberties, to let the great people, the smart people, the powerful business people have their way. I happen to believe that the European model is a better one. Now, I'm not talking about China and the rise of India and all that at the moment, but I think those two philosophies sort of essentially underpin what's happening in the world particularly around climate, a very good example. And as ever, there are some elements in what people do that you can grab and say, hey, that's good, you know. Put six really bright young men and women in a place and pay them, you know, 50,000 bucks a month and say, come up with a great idea to do X. Totally, there's no question. Funny that you use the word X because uh, <laughs> X is sort of Elon's, uh, you know. Jump Elon's, straight into it, didn't yeah, I? Elon's letter. But, yeah, I mean, that's interesting because – the way that they would say, when you say that they're, meaning the sort of techno-utopian libertarians in Silicon Valley, that their attitude is anti-democratic, they would say that's a very socialist point of view about what democracy is because you've got this sort of faith in the, the state as being the locus of the demos, right? And they would say, unleash the power of the individual and human beings will all in an Adam Smithian sort of way, you know, get along and help each other, uh, you know, respect the autonomy of the individual. And that that's for the fundamental kind of unit of democracy, right? Is the individual <laughs> rather than the rather than the collective action? And they they might even concede that there are collective action problems like climate that require that the market isn't going to fix on its own and will need guidance like a carbon tax or you know an emissions trading scheme or something like that. But they would say that the the closer you can leave the centre of action to the individual and the market, the best the better result you're going to get. What do you say to that? Well, it's not all they say. A part of it I, I agree with. I think we should have... Uh, I mean, that's probably not what Peter Thiel would say, no, but no. it's probably what Elon Musk and yeah. Mark Zuckerberg would say. So I think they're, I think they're fundamentally wrong, um, and I think they're fundamentally dangerous, ultimately. On the question of giving people the freedom to you know, innovate and to explore and to develop new ideas and so on and so forth, no argument from me, you know, and neither should there be from anyone. But on the argument that government's got no business in my life, complete argument from me. Uh, 
I mean, what happens to these people when the sea level rise in Florida starts running over their walls? Like, I mean, they can't gate, in, they can't produce a gated community that's going to stop a climate crisis. Well, Elon money <laughs> probably can. But no, <laughs> no I, I seriously don't think he can. And I mean, some of them go and build these massive underground bunkers, you know, on the South Island of New Zealand. It is fatuous. It is, it'll be seen as a sign of utterly dislodged insanity at a later point in time. Mm. People look back on it, they'll go, what the hell? But the other part of it is pretty straightforward. They don't want to pay taxes. They believe that they can create their own utopian vision by what rules, under what levels of accountability, um, how are they employing people, um, you know, how would it work? And the truth of it is that they haven't thought that through. They haven't been able to get one of their single funny little, you know, cosmic islands or everybody in a bubble in <laughs> Arizona or whatever. You know. And they never will. That's the truth of it. They never will. What they may get is a very autocratic government, you know, a figure like a Trumpian figure or whatever, who says, hey, I recognise what you guys are doing and I'm very supportive, but by the way, I'm going to lock up people that disagree with me and put them in jail. Um, you know, there are really basic fundamentals. They're, they're under challenge. There's no question by these But why people. do you but, think they would do that when, I mean, part of the problem with Elon Musk at the moment is that he's come blundering into Twitter and has sort of removed their content moderation in a way that allows a cacophony of free speech that's letting, uh, you know, hate speech flourish and so on. I, I mean, his instinct strikes me as being anti-authoritarian, isn't it? I mean, isn't this well, isn't part of the libertarian Well, I don't spend a lot of time. I don't spend, I mean, you know, I don't, I've noticed my Twitter decline Become rapidly. horrible, yeah. yeah. just really awful. But I don't spend a lot of time actually following him around. He doesn't, right. you know, he, he's not ringing my bells, really, <laughs> to be blunt. Right, right. <laughs> and when you said an interesting thing about, like, you know, Peter Thiel's New Zealand bunker and, you know, how future generations will regard this as being totally bonkers, you didn't qualify future generations by saying, if we're all still around. In a few centuries, well, I think. Look, you're hu optimistic. Hu humans are ultimately highly adaptable. We're a very communicative species. We've mastered technologies. We can make choices, including moral and political and social choices. So there's nothing to say that we can't be around. It's just that we need to break some very bad habits and get active on other things to ensure that the what we're around to is palatable. And at the moment, it probably isn't. In terms of the transition away from fossil fuels, you mentioned solar and wind. You didn't mention nuclear. It's a no-go? It is for me, and I think it ultimately will be even these so-called small reactors that are being talked up by the industry now. I mean, we've got to, if we sit back and look at it, what is the objection to having an energy system where individuals, communities and countries draw on their natural renewable and non-harmful energy sources to create energy to support themselves. Like in well, Iceland... The objection, the objection would be there's nothing wrong with that in the long term, but in the short term, the climate crisis is but severe the, enough that the, we can't get the pivot done quickly enough well, without some uh, interim uh, technologies uh, uh, like uh, nuclear. Utter, utterly reject nuclear as being the answer to that, and clearly isn't for a couple of reasons. The first is that we don't have to wait. I mean, if Germany can sort of get its solar penetration up around the 40, 50% in a country that suffers a long winter, then you know, there's many, many, many countries around the world that can do it equally well. The, the renewable technologies are there and the cost nut on renewable, particularly on solar, has come down. It's just a matter, again, it's just a matter of doing it. It's a matter of will. But there's another point with nuclear, and it's very simple. Who bears the cost, ultimately, of having to still manage and store um, high-level radioactive waste, weapons-grade waste, waste that hangs around for tens of thousands, if not more years. Who bears that responsibility? And ultimately, insurance companies won't bear it. Communities, quite rightly, don't want to bear it. But if you are going to have it, someone has to bear that cost and take that responsibility. And that is a far, far greater cost and responsibility than I think pretty much most countries are going to take, with the exception of a few. France Sorry, is do you one. mean the cost of the risk of a disaster or the cost of maintaining nuclear waste over tens of thousands of years? Well, it's both, but it's the latter in particular. Because won't governments do that? Don't governments? Well, I mean, we, we, yeah, but, we store other people's nuclear waste in Australia, don't we? I mean, not you know, or at least we talk about it. <laughs> not, we talk about doing No, no, it. We, uh, very, very little and all low level at right, the moment. Right, right. Um, but what is it, what is a government, Josh? When you when you boil it down, I mean, you might say at the moment a government is Anthony Albanese here and you know someone in another country, but basically governments are people. I yeah. mean, we we are the government ultimately, and we would be the ones bearing the cost. That is not fair, not equitable, and actually not safe. Right. I mean, some of the quote unquote environmentalist 
pro-nuclear people say that you're going to need baseload power you know you need something you need we we need either need really really good batteries or like some some other storage mechanism like you know you pump water up to dams on the top of mountains and stuff like that so that it can flow down yeah um but when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining you got to have some stop gap and that that stop gap is currently coal and it might as well be nuclear for the next 20 to 40 years until battery technology gets yeah. good enough. Look, again, it's a rubbish argument. I mean, it, it takes you between 20 and 40 years to get one up. And the one they tried to get up in America fell over because it was too expensive. They can't get through the regulatory hurdles. If someone wants to green light it over time, then you're going to end up with something which has the potential to actually not work properly. And then you're leaking radioactive material into the atmosphere. And you've only got to look at Fukushima to see what happens when that does take place. But the other part of it is that I've heard these arguments forever and a day, and these arguments don't take into account the fact that if we manage our own energy consumption consciously in any country, in any suburb, and in any street, then the fact that we have to use energy carefully at different times is something which we can build into our cultural matrix very, very easily. Right. And if we had smart grids... All if, of you that. Know, if you turned on your, if you tried totally. to turn on your washing machine and it said, "Do you want to save fifty percent by turning myself on at two a.m. instead all, of at six all of that. p.m.?" Well, uh, hey, mate, I was in a government that did yeah. some of that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we're getting and, to that. And then, we're getting to that. and then, and then, and then another lot, lot got in and, and tried to get rid of it all. Mm. But people liked it. Mm. People mm. responded to it. And why wouldn't you? You know, you're actually being empowered. You're not some just person sort of getting a bill and thinking, "Oh, what the hell?" You're actually actively involved in. It. Second thing to say is that. We haven't discussed a bunch of other things here other than behavioural change. We haven't looked at energy efficiency seriously at all. I mean, when I drive over the Harbour Bridge and I look over my shoulder and I see 90% of the buildings at 9 and 10 o'clock at night still blazing away with their mm. lights on, I know that we haven't actually mm. gotten on top of how we can actually conserve energy. Absolutely. You know, yeah. I just, mean, not to mention the way that we build buildings here. Anyone who's lived in a cold climate, for exactly. example, I lived in New York for a yeah. dozen years and came back here. Yeah. And moved into a place, and you'd turn that, you'd blast the heater on, yeah. and you could literally. I was living in an old, uh, you know, weatherboard uh, house in Balmain, and you could see a totally. gap between the yeah. floor and the the wall boards where the where the hot air was just escaping. There's yeah. no idea of having double glazing or you know any of that yeah. so, or insulation. No, look, there's one, one final thing to say, which is, I mean, I, when I first started getting involved in activism, and the oils were going out and playing with Greenpeace and what have you, people used to say, oh. There is a reason why uh, we've got pollution. There's a reason why these things are difficult because over here you've got power companies um, who are selling us a product, but we can actually probably get hold of that product more cheaply and control it ourselves. And I think at the time I thought it was a slightly simple analysis of things, but I've actually come to believe it's really true. And my reason for that is very straightforward. Why is it that we still permit a Woodside or a Santos or a BHP or a Shell to do something which is arguably way more dangerous to us than what uh, the tobacco companies were doing 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, when they themselves already have the research that shows what the damage will be, what happens when we are in the middle of a climate crisis, whether it's bushfires or a flood or an intense cyclone or whatever, and that their business model is predicated on doing that for as long as they can until it's stopped. Now, we just need the courage to say, You've gone too far already, mm. but you're not going any further. Mm. And guess what? In Australia, we've got one of the biggest uptake of solar panels on people's roofs. People get it. And they're very happy to well, generate their own the, power and, and save we, money. And we have the government incentives to do it. I mean, in yeah. places like the States, it's just a lot harder to, mm. to do that sort of thing. There isn't, you know, you need to jump through a lot more legislative hoops, you totally. know, more regulations, yeah. it's more expensive, you don't get the same rebates and so on. Um, how much of it is up to us as individuals and how much of it is a is a collective problem? Like I feel bad about the fact that I fly a lot. Well, you probably fly a lot, right? Me too. Well, I'm trying to fly less. I mean, it sounds a bit lame, but no, I really, I agree. It, yeah. That's, that's hard. Have you ever flown private? You mean in my own planes? From yeah, to no, not <coughs> in someone's plane that was not a commercial flight. Uh, many, many years ago, I flew from Sydney to Kuma, I think, with uh, – um, Dick Pratt, the busy oh, right. managing director, we were trying uh, to talk very, him into stop, very chopping rich, down. Very rich Australian whose yeah. uh, who's industry was uh, boxes Yeah, and boxes, bo boxes and forests. Stuff. And we yeah. were trying to get them out of native forest logging. Actually, mm. they did get out of native forest logging. So I've done that. And in government, I've been on 
Uh, what, oh, of what course, are government. The, the VIP yeah, planes. Yeah, essentially. But no, otherwise, no. Our Air Force One uh, type things, <laughs> uh, but a little bit less, uh, yeah. less glam. Um, and I usually reject criticisms of it because I just don't see a pathway to wrestling with a problem as large as climate chaos simply by me trying to be nice. Yeah. Okay. You well, know, I, I, you, like, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to lift your game. Okay. Basically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a lot. Suitably chastised. Um, As do I. So look, I think you know, in broad terms, this is something we, a lot of people wrestle with, and I certainly have wrestled with it over the years. So I think it's a nuanced discussion. It's not a simplistic, you know, black and white discussion in one way. It's simplistic in another. We need to do whatever we can to reduce our emissions, and we need to argue very strongly and try and persuade the powerful entities in our in our world, uh, political parties, superannuation funds, banks, the media, whatever, that this is very, very dear to us and important. Having done that, we need to look into our life and to see what we can actually do whilst they're getting their act together to set the proper regulations in place, to make the rules, to penalise the polluters, to reward the innovators. But there's stuff I'm sure I can do. Okay, but when it comes, the, the no. world is not going to be changed by stuff that Peter Garrett. I mean, oh, it may be no, because no, Peter it, Garrett it, it does it through his art or through no, his no, politics. No, no, but it's, not, not as an individual human a, being. A, a, absolutely, we all know what's going to happen. There's going to have to be no. laws about energy efficiency. There's going to have to be an international compact that puts a price on carbon, one way or another, for everybody, and that'll fix the problem and incentives for technology. Yeah, but, but but look, the point's well made, but the point isn't well made to say that Peter Garrett or any individual Josseps by themselves do or don't make a difference. Because of course they do. Because it's not me sitting in a football field with 95,000 other people around me doing something completely different. It's me and potentially 30, 40, 50, 60, and eventually maybe persuading 80 or five or 90,000 people to do the same thing. And once people act in that way, I mean, sure, they're doing it themselves, but you know, they're not an isolated entity and they're not a speck on the landscape where everything else is different. They're with all sorts of other people like that who if they make the same decision, you get the same result. So the short answer is you need both. You very much need both. You need, you need to be doing whatever you can within reason that you can manage in your life. You're not going to sort of hurt someone else to do that. And you need to push hard on your politics. And on travel... Um, you know, do I want to go to the Antarctica and have a good look at it? And would I love to have a bucket list of places I'm going to fly to here and there? I'd love to, but I'm reaching the point where I, I don't think I can justify it. Mm. I'm lucky enough to have travelled, although most of it's been for work. Would I travel for work? Yes, I would, because there's probably no other way I can easily do the work. We're employing people and so on and so forth. So, I mean, there are lines and nuances in there. You can argue it any which way. I totally get that. Uh, air travel, though, is going to become an issue for us in another way which is that up to this point in time, we've taken for granted, and I'm one of those people, and I'm that generation, I'm a boomer, that, hey, I can jump on a plane pretty much whenever I want to go wherever I want. And there's more and more travel than there's ever been before. It was cheaper up until COVID than it's ever been before, but it's not included in the climate negotiations, the protocols, the COPs, the Paris agreements, the da-da-da, because most of these airlines are owned by governments who sort of don't want to go there because mm. they don't want to say to people, well, actually, your tickets are going to cost twice as much and we're now waiting for, you know, the new sustainable Richard Branson plane to glide in and land, mm. you know, mm. Sydney or whatever it might be. So I think air travel is is heading into a really difficult and um, let's just say bumpy ride. I had a really interesting uh, um, tour around a NASA facility in the States when I was working on an energy show in <laughs> America, and I was a correspondent looking at renewable energy and stuff. And they, um, they w they've got a lab where they're testing um, algaes, right? Yeah. And the algae is, is produces a biofuel. The yeah. biofuel fuels the plane. Correct. And although the plane is still is still uh, producing emissions, they call it closing the carbon loop, yeah. where the, the plane produces the emissions, the emissions get absorbed by the algae, the yeah. algae becomes the fuel, the fuel. And so th this was their sort of sunny, Pollyanna, optimistic yeah, way yeah. of saying, don't worry, we can keep flying yeah, yeah, as much as we want exactly, to. Yeah. We'll just as long as we make sure that, you know, yeah. we're soaking up the carbon that we're putting yeah. out. So who, who knows? Uh, who knows whether that's going to work? Um, why did you go into politics then. So you started in the Nuclear Disarmament Party, which was a tiny you know, party that didn't really go anywhere. Uh, oh, they, got a, they got a senator <laughs> they got, in the parliament. They got a senator. <laughs> um, and then you went mainstream. I mean, then you, did you get headhunted specifically? Was it during the late, was it when Mark Latham was Correct. Labor leader? Yeah, it was when and Latham was leader. You? Yeah. He yeah, yeah. came and said, would I be interested? And what was your initial instinct? Uh, well, I'd finished up, 
I'd come off the road and, you know, I was uh, the president of the Australian Conservation Foundation for a couple of terms and yep. I was just finishing that term. That's a big environmental group here it's in Australia. It's a big environmental for group here in Australia. Australia. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I was spending quite a bit of time in Canberra and I'd worked with governments of both persuasions, but probably more closely with Labor. And I'd seen what happens when uh, an environment minister decides to do A or B. I'd spent a lot of time in there persuading them to do things. And I thought, well, if there's an opportunity to take that uh, role, then I'll do it. And look, I've been a long-term student of politics. So I wasn't there, – there's, there's a picture that exists from an external picture of what politics is. It's been – Unfortunately, confirmed by uh, the ABC's latest sort of you know drivel on Nemesis, but the truth of it is that it's a, it's a very multifaceted, complex, and sometimes grindingly boring exercise <laughs> in trying to make things work better. <clears throat> and I was very happy to go and try and be a part of that if I got the chance. So Latham and a few others, uh, John Faulkner and a few other Labor elders had said, "Look, you know, we, are you interested in coming? We'd like you to be a part of it." Uh, so did they, they how did they do that? Did they come and visit you, or did they shoot you an email? Or do you uh, well, I knew I, were... I, I knew them. I knew them anyway beforehand. So we just had you were socialising. Uh, not so much socialising, but in touch. Right. Yeah. Right. So I mean, I was in. I was. I was in the. I was a lobbyist essentially. I, yes, like, of course. I spent. So I, you'd be in the room with them anyway. I see. Of yeah, course. So in I your see, capacity as the, yeah. as the head of this environmental. Group. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm spending like weeks in Canberra. Yeah. Knocking on people's doors. And was there a point at which Mark Latham, who was the leader of the opposition Labor Party at the time, uh, you know, turned to you and said, "We could really use you in yes in government if we yep. win." Yep. Did you have to think about it? No. Yeah. So then. They win power, but Mark Latham is no longer the Labor leader. Correct. Kevin Rudd has come swooping in. It was yep. a historic election. A lot well, of actually, still... Beasley, Beasley. Sorry, there was Kim. Be... Kim was... Oh, poor old yeah. Kim. No, no. Poor old Kim. I know. <laughs> Kim Beasley was briefly the uh, opposition leader. Yes, he leader, was. Yeah. Who is an incredibly accomplished Australian. And Absolutely. sorry, Kim, I don't mean to. No, no. I mean, I'm, I have nothing but massive respect for Kim Beasley, uh, former defence uh, minister, is that right? And, um, you know, hugely accomplished, but yeah. was not uh, did not prove to be the uh, the opposition leader who would lead Labor to, to government. Kevin Rudd was. There was a landmark uh, win in 2007 um, for people who don't remember or who aren't Australian. Australia had had a, a centre right. Conserva- very conservative government, really, for yeah. a long time, well over a decade, for, with the second longest serving prime minister in Australia's history. And uh, Kevin Rudd was a very slick, um, uh, you know, good marketing, you know, good, good talk, good at talking on TV. Kevin 07. Kevin 07 was yeah. the slogan. It was very, it was a very, it was a sort of almost Obama esque kind of moment in Australian politics. We finally apologised to the indigenous population. You know, there were a lot of reforms that felt like we were moving on from a stale. Uh, period in Australia's history. You become environment minister, but you don't get the climate change portfolio. He gives that to Penny Wong. Correct. Yeah. Was that a slab in the face? Uh, well, slab in the face, you call it what you will. I mean, one of the primary reasons that I said yes wasn't only that I knew that a government could get stuff done, which I thought would make the country better, but I was despairing uh, of the years that we'd spent with the centre-right parties that you've just talked about running the place, particularly on climate. And I felt that, um, I mean, Howard, uh, who was Prime Minister, John Howard at the time, actually commissioned a report which said to him, look, you can set up an emissions trading scheme and we can start to reduce greenhouse emissions and we can start to do something about it. It'll be pretty low key, but we could do it. And even that was too much for them. It was a bridge too far. And so for me, who was already working on these things and you know, felt very strongly about them, I thought if I can be part of the team that dislodges John Howard, I'll be happy. Uh, I didn't um, set my sights on having any kind of portfolio, Josh. I didn't join a faction when I went in to the. But parliament. you were a sh- the shadow environment spokesperson, correct? In opposition, absolutely. So yeah. it would stand to reason that you would take over the environment portfolio oh, and, 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 be and all of the for all of the climate policy, or well, not all of it, but a fair bit of the climate policy at that time. Uh, was worked up by me in my office because right, I, but then you get I into the government, and all of a sudden, yeah. you're not the minister who's responsible Correct. for negotiating at, yeah. at the international level. It's the gift of the leader, and it's also the gift of the factions. And I mean, this is a really interesting conversation in a way because it's such a long time ago now. And I didn't agonise for too long, but I did give some thought before I went in as to whether I would join the left or right faction, and I decided that I would join neither. And that was partly because there were aspects of each that I really liked and aspects of each which I didn't quite share the value set. What did you like about the right faction? Uh, practical, 
you know, driven to sort of get stuff done, effective, disciplined, the sort of things that you need to have in government. I dealt with um, the right factional leaders back in the day when Hawke was Prime Minister and negotiating preference things with the Green Movement and so on and so forth. So, I mean, would I go and hang out and have beers with them and talk about our favourite bands? No. But could I sit down and have a sensible, rational discussion about them as to what may or may not happen? Yes. So that's the part I liked about them. Right. And and economically, probably more orthodox, but probably more responsible than the left. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You strike me as more lefty. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) Do you remember finding out that you weren't going to be in charge of uh, climate change? Sure, of course. Yeah. How did that happen? Did Kevin Rudd tell you? Oh, I can't remember the details, but look- you know, it's the gift of the leader and it's the gift of the factions. And well, I you say that, but no, I mean, no, it's but a little it's, bit rich, isn't it? You've no, been working but, on it for all this time. Oh, well, look, you know, it's a long hey. time. Mate, I'm not going to slip my yeah, wrist right. about it. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. I had plenty to do. I, mm. get, I had other jobs as well. And was there a difficulty? I mean, you know, this is the perennial sort of conundrum of being inside the tent rather than outside of it being the critic. You come from this position of, of authority and respect in Australian creative arts where you basically had the ability to say fuck you to whoever you want to and totally. to say whatever you want to. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're in yeah. government and you're wearing a suit and you're all buttoned up yeah. and, you know, the position on forests and the position on the Tasmanian pulp mill and the position on uh, US military bases in Australia is all very different from stuff you've been singing about for well, decades. Well, I, I don't think that's quite right. I think that uh, – well, let, let me deal with the, the, the big question first. We, don't, we can dive into as much of this yeah, detail yeah. as you like. But yeah. um, I understood better than anybody else. I've said this many times before, but I understood probably better than anyone else what I was entering into. But I'm not a starry-eyed utopian who thinks that, you know, fairies are responsible for putting pumpkins at the bottom of the garden. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not. <laughs> And I'd seen politics up close. And anyone who's a student of politics understands what's involved. And none of my views and my attitude about what I thought or felt or believed in changed at all when I went into politics. It's just that I didn't broadcast it to the world anymore if it was at odds with the party that I had joined. And some parts of it were at odds with the party I joined. Not a lot, probably less than just about anywhere else, maybe the Greens, but probably not much. So... I was ready for that discipline and, you know, I knew I was going to lose skin, but to be really clear about it, the respect and the adoration and the way we look up at people in the artistic and creative world, it's pretty facile at times. You know, you have your moment in the sun and then everybody thinks you're a sun god. Well, actually, maybe you just got lucky, you know. So, Right, but while you're lucky... You have a big impact, don't you, on people, on the way people – you can draw people's attention. But the, but think no, about the impact that you had on the way that Australians think about Indigenous land rights. Yeah, but look, let's, let's talk about impact. I mean, impact has got so many different and important measurements and critiques. What about the impact of introducing a funding system in education? When I became Education Minister and Julie Gillard became Prime Minister and gave me all her portfolios – which ensures that Aboriginal students get paid or are supported and their schools are supported to a greater extent than people in well-off areas. Mm. I mean, that is a massive impact. What about taking Japan to the International Court of Justice to stop, you know, so-called scientific whaling in the Southern Ocean? That is a massive impact. I mean, I could rock on forever. So, yes, you've got a voice when you're out. Of course you do. But you can also do stuff when you're in. I mean, I've been in and out and I'm Mm. out again. Mm. (laughs) Mm. And I understand how both of them work. And both of them, you can do stuff. I mean, it's fascinating. Like if you, when you die and you go to heaven and there is there, if there's a big ledger, you know, with the impact that Peter Garrett has had on the world and there's a, there's some old fashioned weighing scales with those little, uh, you know, the little weights that you put on them, which side is, which side is heavier? Like so this is the difference. This is the difference or? between a journalist and, and a person. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> like that. <laughs> it may just be the difference between Josh Sepps and the uh, yeah, well, normal, the normal person. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I honestly don't think about it. And to get back to the thing about not having the climate responsibility, you know, once I was non-factionalized, I was on my own in there. All I had was my uh, capacity to work, to develop trusting relationships with people, and to express my views. And to be a team player, which is I understood and I wanted to be. That was the team I joined. 
I didn't join right, to become. But there was another team that you left. Like, I mean, in the 2006, I think it was the Victorian state election, Bob Brown had a go at you, who was the head of the Greens. For you know, you oh, were yeah, you but, were saying yeah. that like you were encouraging people to vote for Labor. Yeah, and saying, really, oh, look, The well, Greens are just gonna. That, that's the a, Greens will be in an alliance with the that, right wing. Wasn't it, wasn't it the silliest thing on earth? I mean, that. that but that, was it? I mean, from the Greens' yeah. perspective, it's like, well, hang on, you were part of our tribe. No, now I wasn't going part. Of, no, no, no. Well, you were an environmentalist. I mean, well, you weren't part of the party, but you're like, yeah, but you know, the fact the fact that people confuse the Green Party with environmentalists is just that's a part of our political culture but i mean give me a break you know i'm in the labor party i'm a member of parliament and i've been criticized for campaigning for the labor party well you know sorry right right <laughs> but i mean it, it's they, nah. they regard it as being a betrayal oh, of your, and they I made, know, your pure i suppose it's a purity test right about like you was, used to be a good guy and now you've sold out they 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 pursuits. bought it they bought into the same um framing that murdoch and the Australian bought into, so it was very interesting. You know, you, you had the you had the Greens on the left, on the and on the far left, if you like, and you had Murdoch and Co on the far right. What way can we damage this person who is probably going to become a minister and will be in the cabinet? Well, we damage him by saying, "Oh, look, you know, he was he was a purer purer than pure, um, spouting green politics from the stage, and right. now and now he's a nasty, dirty Labor politician, you know, abiding by the policies of the party." Shock. It's, right. It's like the charge of hypocrisy is sort of the easiest way for a cynical oh, people was, to <clears> take <throat> you down, isn't it? Because oh, there's, yeah. no, there's no way to escape it no, because no. everyone is compromised. Exactly. And and you know what? I, I knew all of that and I just you just let that stuff go. And the same with this business of, you know, where did you end up or what did you have? I mean, I, I, you, people are watching this thing on TV in this country at the moment, the former Conservative Party tear themselves to pieces. But I this is a three-part ABC yeah, series yeah. about the, but, the previous leaders. Yeah, but one of, the of their prime Liberal ministers, yeah, Malcolm Turnbull, who some people will know, he's been on this show. You can go yeah. back and find the uh, yeah. The well, interview. there you go. I'm sure, <laughs> and he would have defended his position. I'm sure. Yep. But I know, uh, remember, he had a conversation with him about because we went in at the same time. Yeah, right. We knew one another before we went in. We were high-profile figures. We shared a common boundary, so we were quite often doing events together. And I've got a lot of time for Turnbull in some ways. Yeah. But I said to him, look, Malcolm, there is a difference between you and me, what we're doing, because we were sort of saying, you know, it's ridiculous the way in which you sort of get judged by this sort of persona thing that the media creates when actually you're down in the ditches trying to do a bit of work. Okay, whatever. I said, yeah, there is one difference, though. You have come here to be prime minister. I've come here to be a serving member of the Labor Party. And it was true. Uh, the big question around whether I should have done environment at all because of the expectations and the easy way in which it could be parodied. I actually think we got an amazing amount done. And so I'm happy to say that it's the most effective term that any environment minister's had in Australia. I'll, I'll just say that, not trying to be immodest, but that's I'll state it and I think it's on the record. But I actually enjoyed myself more and felt like I was doing a better job when I was education minister because oh, I didn't know anything about it yeah. much and I had to learn from the ground up and we had a, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's very important to the country and that's what I went to do. I went to be a working politician. I, I mean, it's ridiculously naive and, and Maybe it sounds self-serving, but I actually did go to serve. I mean, I didn't have to go there for the money. I didn't have to go there for the hand claps. You know, I wanted mm, to go. Mm, mm. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? I mean, it makes my, it gives me a little tingle up the spine to think about how a democratic process works where just a, a person Absolutely. runs for office, yeah. you know, is able to get elected, no, <laughs> is totally. able to suddenly you know, have a major impact on the direction of the country just because people go, yeah, thumbs up, let's oh, try this guy. Look, it's incredible. And, you know, I mean, for me now, uh, particularly after my time in ACF but also in politics, I'm looking at younger people that either worked with me or for me or were young activists campaigning on the environment. They're in state parliaments, they're governments, they're mm. ministers, they're, they're – they're stepping up and doing that thing as well. And they're going through the same sort of, oh, I've really got to try and get this done thing. It's just that all of mine was done in technicolour and widescreen yeah. and public. Yeah, exactly. Um, how was working with Mark Latham? You mentioned him. I'd forgotten that he was the person who... I, 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 never, I never got to work with him. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, in opposition though. Correct. No? Oh, was very gone? little. He, got, he, he went pretty quick. It went quick. pretty quick, yeah. What's how, what, what do you make of his evolution? I, I honestly don't understand it and... It's a For bit people of a who don't who don't know who are abroad, this was a very mm. was the head of the Labor Party who has now subsequently become. Um, he was a member for a, a, you might call it a far right party, One Nation, a sort of anti-immigrant, you know, ultra conservative yeah. party, yeah. and then he was kicked out of that party. But basically, he's he's quite a a, a pro populist, anti-immigrant um, politician now, which is very different from the figure that he presented when you worked with him. Yeah, I mean, I. I 
I went to one of the town hall meetings that he did just to see what he was like. And I mean, he gave a pretty good speech and then he stayed and took questions from everybody for literally about 40 or 50 minutes. And I thought, wow, this is like democracy in action. Yeah. I mean, people do change. They do swing from pillar to post. I probably haven't changed much. Uh, it's it's funny. No, I was listening to the new album and I was going, this man is consistent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is, Sorry. He's a, he's a consistent artist. You know what you're going to get. Oh, mate. Yeah. Oh, I'm um, trying. <laughs> all right. Uh, how about uh, how are you feeling about this year? I mean, I'm, I'm, I go back and forth about optimism and pessimism about the fate of, I mean, just pla- the, the, the planet, politics. You mentioned instability. You mentioned, you know, peace and love and nuclear weapons. Yeah, um, we've got an election in the United States. We've got an election in the UK. Yeah. Both very consequential. Absolutely. We've got a war raging in Europe. Yes, we do. Uh, yeah, look, it's a, it, it, it is a really difficult time wherever you sit in the world and however close you're paying attention. Uh, and I must confess, Josh, for the first time ever over Christmas, I thought I'm just totally taking time out. Plus, I made a record that I really love and I've enjoyed being able to do that. It's important to me. I feel, you know, my blood is sort of still pumping essentially when I do that. And it's about stuff that's important to me and I care about and I hope people listen to it. But it's that other side of my life, which I'm lucky enough to have. So I took some time out from it. Um, I'm always going to be optimistic, but I think that we need to find a way, if we're communicators like I am, of sharing what we think and feel about things with others that doesn't make them switch off and feel like it's all too hard and all too much. And I think about the victories that I've been involved in or the good steps that have been taken, not me personally doing stuff, but working with others, whether it's a community group to stop sand mining on Seven Mile Beach on the South Coast or whether it's being in the government and deciding that we were going to introduce something which changed people's lives and made a big difference to them and everything in between. Uh, And if I look at the long course of history where the discrimination, the bias, the prejudices and the imposition of power on people who are either non-elected or weren't in the right family, i.e. the royal family, has started to be washed away. I mean, there's a lot of fight back, but it's started to be washed away. I feel positive. But if I look at what's happening right now, I think this is a tricky, difficult moment. And uh, be informed. Mm. When you talk about people who are not elected or born into the right family, uh, um, (laughs) what do you make of republicanism in Australia at the moment? I mean, it's like... I was such an ardent. I was the president of the Republican Association at university at Good uni. On you. Uh, which, which one for UTS? Okay, yeah. uh, doing journalism and communications. Yeah. Uh, yeah, is that is that your? UNSW. Oh, you're you're yeah. NSW. You're doing the same thing. Okay, that's that's just uh, our our publicist, our wonderful publicist from Sony, who's uh, who's joining. Um, Peter here. So, uh, and you know, at the time, I, fe- I felt like so. This is the turn of the millennium. This is yeah. when um, we're having a referendum about it. Correct. Uh, and for non-Australians, this was a, de- a, a referendum about whether or not to remove the Queen as the head of state and create a, a you know a democratically uh, not democratically elected but a democratic head head of state. Correct. Yeah. Um, <coughs> now we're, we're on the same team here. Yeah, and yeah. yet now, yeah. I sort of look around the world yeah. no, and I go. Yeah. Like there are worse things. <laughs> there are worse things. Than oh, really? You're going to go I there? I, I, honestly, oh. like I haven't, don't worry, I haven't been lost to the cause, but there are worse things than stupid, stable, pomp-filled, undemocratic <laughs> systems. I don't so, know. So, yeah, I'm not going to go with you You're on that. You're not coming with me on that nah, journey. Nah, sorry. I'm... I'm I'm ridiculously unreconstructed and a purist. <laughs> <laughs> Not malleable at all. Yeah. Look, I, I, I get it. In, I mean, the Scandinavian model's fine, you know. They ride a bike. They go and teach. Mm. You know, they mm. have their own businesses. They don't get a million tax breaks. You know, they sort of provide some sense of stability and something that people can identify with and look up with. Look, I understand that. Um, the charade that we see uh, in the United Kingdom or in England is beyond me. I mean, I... I, I never got it. I never got it when I was a kid, and I feel this, exactly the same way about it. Did I you feel I, anything when the Queen died? No. I mean, people shedding tears. I mean, I don't mean disrespect, but, you know, seriously. I had a funny funny moment, though, with my wife uh, years and years ago at the start of a royal visit, and uh, for some reason we were driving down um, South Downing Street <clears throat> back in the day before they did all the major engineering. Right. 
And we could see the lights, flashing lights and motorbikes and things coming towards us. And we thought, wow, what's going on? I said, oh, wait a minute. I said, oh, Phil and Liz are in town, of course. <laughs> I said, we're going to pull over and, you know, give them the finger. You know, this is me, <laughs> Republican, <laughs> yeah, radical Republican, yeah, lout. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so we pulled over. There was hardly any traffic around because it sort of cleared everyone away. And we got across to the median strip. No cops to stop us. And down they came in the roller or whatever it was with all everything. And were they us. open? Was it open? It wasn't roofed? open. No, no they okay. inside. they're inside their they're bulletproof inside. glass. But they, come yeah. to a, they come towards us, but you can see inside, they're moving so slowly. Right. They're having a discussion. Right. Slash argument. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. And then suddenly someone, the driver must have said, um, mum, you know. Yes, yes. <laughs> Australian plebeians. There is, there is a gentleman <laughs> <laughs> raising the Your plebeian finger. <laughs> well, you didn't give it. You didn't give the No. And no. They sort of turned around and just went straight into wave. Yes. Just automatically. I just thought. My and subjects. Thought, yeah, my subject. But so, I also thought, good on you, you know, like you broke out of having a bicker. Yeah. I, I'm imagining that to part of a little it, <laughs> To wave at these two humble Australian mm, servants, mm. you know. It's funny. I mean, I never would have thought that I would have been at all emotional about such a ridiculous institution. But when she died, when I woke up that morning, I did feel this I was overcome just momentarily with this sense of like foreboding a little bit just that here's this sort of Chuck well the full of thought of Chuck partly but I don't think it was so much the thought of Chuck I th I think it was like all right here's another way in which we're passing into a new era right we've had this 20th century with all of its certainties yeah We've had the same woman on the throne since yeah. my grandmother, you know, was, you know, well, not a little girl, but a yeah. girl. Yeah. And now we're entering into this new, these uncharted waters no, no. with Trump, with Brexit, with yeah. like climate, with everything. And just here's one other small way in which that sense of constancy and duty and sort of permanence and sufferance and kind of, you know, the sort of stoicism that she yeah. represented. Oh, totally, yeah. Uh, is being washed away and well, I don't know, it's sort of irrational, but that was No, what, no, no, that's, that's really illuminating. And I think, I mean, I don't have a great deal of respect for the institution. I mean, she was diligent uh, as a monarch and head of state, but she's not my head of state. And I actually think that that idea of constancy, elders, people holding positions which they sort of apply a protocol to does have a role in our world. We need that sort of thing. Um, I wouldn't want to be exacerbating it too much, but uh, you're deeper than me on that sense because I didn't, I didn't really feel that. And I was well, I may just be more superficial in the sense well, that no, she's no. the most obvious superficial like example of that. But what, then where do we find those elders if not through you know, pomp and tradition? Well, you need, you, you need to find them in your own community and respect them in your own communities and your families and so on. I think that's really important. And maybe we also need to um, have some structures which give them an opportunity to share their wisdom. I mean, there's a council of elders now that's been set up internationally, which provides advice to the UN and people on climate issues and just general. It's just advice only. I think there's a real place for that. Plus, we're living longer. Mm. <laughs> oh, mate. Like, you know, it doesn't necessarily make us wiser, though. It depends no, no, how long. no but, it, but, you know... Let's just use the bell curve and just yeah, assume yeah. that some of us will be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and a lot of us will be, be lasting longer. So, I mean, for me, I think uh, one of the issues here is that we've lost track of the Republican debate and what it means to our culture because we're focused on other things. We're focused on ourselves. We're focused on our screens. Some of us, luckily in my case, not focused on the battle that life is, paying a mortgage or trying to find somewhere to rent or whatever it might be. And we haven't had a consistent expression. To hear the life. rest of this conversation, go to uncomfortableconversations.substack.com slash listen, and you will get your own personal premium podcast feed with at least three extra episodes of the podcast every month and heaps of extra stuff, including the remainder right now of the fabulous conversation you've just been hearing. If it was worth listening to this much of, don't rob yourself of the rest. Pull out your phone right now and search for Uncomfortable Conversations with Substack. Substack.